Happy Sabbath, everybody. Pastor Ron here. We're so glad that you've joined us here this morning uh, on our online campus. Um, and uh, yep, I am standing. I, I wanted to try something a little different today. Um, man, since COVID started, I've been sitting down. I've been <laughs> I spent a lot of time sitting down on for meetings and um, you know c calls and and appointments, and so I'm just tired of sitting down. And I sit down to preach. I spent spent a lot of hours just doing that. And of course, you know it's not good to sit down too much. So I figured I just want to stand. I'm I'm a stand for this message. So see how that goes. But we want to welcome you all. Thank you for hanging out with us. This morning on our online campus, welcome certainly our Detroit Center, Pontiac Southside. Last week, our Pontiac Church opened up for the first time for in-person uh, service since uh, March. And, uh, and today, as I'm speaking, Detroit Center is, uh, is having in-person uh, church service. And so I'm there as well. I'm not omnipresent, as you know, um, but uh, this message was recorded and I'm preaching uh, the same message right now at Detroit Center. So if you're, if you're there, praise God. If you're here, we're so glad that you're here. So do us, do, do us a favor and share this message right now and um, also like this message and let your friends know this is on and and, uh, and come on back uh, uh, and let us know where you're tuning in uh, from uh, this morning. We always love to see where God's reaching uh, in with this ministry. And so um, just for our members, just know at Pontiac Southside Detroit Center, hang out and, until the end where we will have some slides of announcements for you. Um, so stay tuned for that. But I'm going to jump right into our message this morning, part two of our new uh, series, which is entitled uh, Seven uh, Churches of Revelation, subtitle Jesus's Message for His People Then and His People Today. In fact, if you wanted to add something else to that uh, topic, you could say for His People in the future, if the Lord allows this world, God forbid, right, for to go on for another 100 or 200 years, the idea is that the messages, not just in the book of Revelation, but in the entire book of the Bible, uh, will be not will still be applicable and relevant to, to, to folks of all generations. And so and so we're focusing this series on the seven churches of Revelation found in chapter one, chapter two and chapter three. Um, we may tap into chapter four just to kind of round it up. Uh, really nicely this series. Uh, last week, if you uh, were with us, if not, uh, the sermon is on demand on our Pontiac uh, page and Detroit Center. Um, we I just spent time introducing uh, the series and certainly introducing John, who we found out was not the author of the book of Revelation, but he was the scribe, the author of the book of Revelation, as we know, is that of Jesus the Christ. And if anyone were to just sort of hold me uh, down, you know, and say, hey, you know, out of all the 66 books of Scripture, which one would you choose that that would be your favorite, your best, um, or the most important? You know, they're all important, all 66 but if you were to do that, I would say Revelation, because although 65 of the books were inspired by God or written by man, still being God's word, Revelation, for, for the most part, uh, is, God, is Jesus is the one. He's the one that is the author. So it makes it a very profound and important book. We talked about two things, the ultimate message of the book of, of Revelation, and then number two, uh, the motive. So the message is one thing, but but the motive is asking why. Like, why is it the message? So we talked about the message. The message of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ is victor over his enemies. Come on, say amen. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and those who follow him will soon be with him forever. That's the gospel. That's an encouraging word. That's a promise. If we stick it out with Jesus and we believe his word, that we will be with him one day forever and ever. Therefore, it leads to the motive of this book. And here comes the motive. Jesus did not send this book of prophecy to the assemblies at that at that time in order to satisfy their sort of uh, uh, curiosity about the future. No, 
Here's the reality. God's people, right, were going through intense persecution and they needed to be encouraged. They needed to know that they are more than conquerors because Jesus was the conqueror. He fought and defeated hell, death, and the grave, including Satan, making us more than conquerors, that, that they needed to be encouraged and reminded that even though they were going through immense persecution, immense pain uh, on, on behalf, on account of their faith and choosing to follow this Jesus, that it is worth it all and that they needed that encouragement to know that they were not alone. That's the real reason. That's the real motive uh, for the book of Revelation. And we spent time talking last week, kind of focusing on Revelation 1, this call given to John on the Isle of Patmos, right? And, uh, and John being there by himself, sort of an exile by himself, and Jesus pulling him aside. John thinking it can get worse, but not knowing that Jesus was creating a conducive uh, a, a platform, a conducive uh, a, a, a place for, for, for John to receive th this revelation, this unveiling, this revealing, right? And not just, he will soon find out, certainly we will find out that it was not just for these seven churches, but for every single generation. And how do we know that? Well, we talked about it. Remember when Jesus came to John and he began by talking to John from behind John to a Jewish reader. They knew what that meant. That meant that uh, John was about to share something that was going to be for the future because speaking from behind means it's futuristic because we can't see it. But then John turns and sees Jesus, right? He sees him as king of kings, right? Eyes of fire, feet of bronze and in kingly attire, hair of wool and so on. And so, and so seeing Jesus, it, it, it really meant that, no, 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 what I'm, what I'm about to tell you is not just for the future, but it's for the here and now. How many of you believe that God is not just for the future, but for the here and now? And sometimes we get so caught up in future speaking, which is important that we forget to speak into our lives and the lives of people who are struggling, not in the future, not in the past, but in the right now. We need to be encouraged right now. We don't need to be encouraged for 2025 or 2030. 2020, man, we need encouragement 2020 right now. Come on, say amen. And so these messages are going to go out to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Uh, and as we see each of these letters, which will be given to John by angels through Jesus, they're broken down into three parts. And here they are. The first part is going to be uh, ad admonition, uh, sorry, approval. Uh, second part is going to be accusation. Third part is going to be admonition. So, so he's so Jesus is going to uh, um, um, uh, speak to uh, good things that the church, the churches is, is are, are doing, and then he's going to accuse them of some bad things, and then he's not going to leave them there. Man, Jesus is this great counselor. He does not leave you to my meander in the darkness. He says, but even though you're there, and even though you have some bad traits, I'll lift you up. I'll give you an opportunity to change. And so the first church that we're going to focus on today for the next couple of moments is uh, the church called uh, the Ephesians or Ephesus, the church of Ephesus. Um, uh, hopefully we'll have this up here. I think it's going to be a map that's going to right here show you um, what what sort of the layout of, of, of these churches uh, look like. The seven churches actually make geographical sense. Uh, it is the route of a traveler, one would say. From the island of Patmos, as you can see there, uh, the first stop is Ephesus. Uh, one of, by the way, one of the most important uh, ports of all time. And then you go on then to uh, 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 Smyrna, Pergamum, and, and, and so on. Um, I, I have had the chance to visit a few of those seven churches, including uh, Ephesus. Here's a picture of me uh, right there uh, uh, in, in the city of Ephesus. It is a spectacular, just even the ruins are still spectacular. It gives you a glimpse of what was there uh, before, right? Their library is 
but just stunning. Um, as a matter of fact, till today, the goddess Nike, uh, she's laying down in a, in, a, in a particular position. That's where the Nike company gets the swoosh. She's laying down and it looks like a swoosh. I should have put that picture up there. Um, their library is absolutely amazing. The face front of the library is still up today. It is spectacular. Funny story, uh, only men, for the most part, were allowed to go to the library because only they were scholars and could read and so on. Um, and so uh, what most men would do, they would tell their wives, hey, you know, I'm going to the library. And when they would get to the library, as soon as they got into the outer courts of the library, uh, you, you look to the le to the right and there is a little uh, door that led to a tunnel that led away from the library under this, uh, in, in this tunnel that led to like a brothel of, of prostitutes and so on. Honey, how was the library? Oh, it was good. <laughs> you know, and uh, there was also communal bathrooms uh, uh, for the rich and the wealthy. And it was interesting. You go into one of these and there are all these sort of toilets where people would, you know, do their, do their business. What's interesting is in winter when it was cold, it was made out of rock. And uh, what they would do, these rich people, they would they would um, have slaves and servants and they would bring them in and have them sit on these concrete toilets to warm it up. And when it was warm enough, they would tell them to get up and then they'll use it. It's crazy. It was certainly a quite paganistic, secular uh, a, a, a city, Ephesus uh, and the Ephesians, but a spectacular city, uh, city nonetheless. The word Ephesus in the, in the Greek literally translates to the word desirable. Uh, the, New, the New Testament uh, traces the full history of the church. Uh, in Ephesus from its foundings back in Acts chapter 18 to facing the rebuke that we're about to read in, in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, with the meaning desirable, Ephesus in many ways was certainly a desirable place uh, uh, to call uh, home. In the ancient world, Ephesus was the center of travel and commerce. Situated on the Aegean Sea at the mouth of the uh, Kaispar River, the river, the city was one of the greatest seaports in the ancient world. Quite fascinating. As a matter of fact, the water would come all the way up until the city limits. Not today. It's receded way back. Um, but it would come up all the way. It was spectacular. When you would come, they would welcome you in. Uh, ships would say, uh, people would, would write about it. They, they would be able to see. They were able to see Ephesus from miles away uh, in the sea. It looked like a diamond, almost like an emerald city like Seattle. And, uh, and, uh, and you would see it. And then if you were a dignitary or someone of of importance, uh, you they would welcome you in and fanfare and 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 all that stuff with musicians and dancers and so on. Uh, uh, the the port was so important that three major roads led from that port. Uh, one of the road. Uh, led to Babylon through uh, Laodicea. We'll talk about that later. Uh, another one uh, went north via Smyrna. We'll get to that later. And the third one uh, went south to the Meter Valley. Very, very important. On Paul, Paul, who was once Saul but became Paul, remember, Christian now, uh, and real church planter, probably one of the first most successful church planters in, in, in history. Uh, uh, Paul, on his second missionary journey in about AD 52, uh, is when he visited uh, Ephesus after leaving Corinth and, and evidently planted the church there as seen in the book of Acts chapter 18, verse 19. On Paul's third missionary journey, uh, he spent between two to three years teaching in the city, which was quite fascinating because when he spent time there, he began addressing the issues like false doctrines and pagan practices. And Paul's teaching, which was happening in a rented room from uh, 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 Tyrannus, one of the top leaders there. It was so successful what Paul was preaching that uh, magicians at the time gave their lives to Jesus. And in a show of full on repentance, took all their... Um, their 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 books of of magic and sorcery as as seen in the book of acts and brought it and had some of this bonfire to show that they were done with uh this thing called magic and all that stuff right um 
it was it was it was good, but it was problematic for the uh, goldsmiths and the silversmiths of the time because no uh, uh, people orders for um, for uh, for idol building dropped significantly. So they didn't like Paul, and eventually Paul had to leave and went to Macedonia. Uh, Macedonia, sorry. The church, Ephesus, in, in Ephesus, uh, enjoyed stellar leadership, uh, first led by Paul, then his protege, Timothy, and eventually John, the one who's, 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 who's uh, scribing the book of Revelation. About a decade after the church had been started, Paul wrote the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. It's called the book uh, uh, you know, Ephesians in the New Testament. And, and, and in that, he commended their faith and their love. A careful reading of this epistle, the, the book of Ephesians, shows that they had done very well, these new Christians in Ephesus. They appeared to be devout in their faith. That's good. And they were well organized and busy in doing the gospel, doing the work of Jesus. This is a good church. During these early years, they had been growing and expanding and doing the will of God. Jews and Gentiles were worshiping together from several ethnicities and nationalities. Uh, they had all come together to, to, to live out this, this calling in Ephesians 2, 6, the living the one new man or the one body, the one body in Christ. They were multi-ethnic as well as diverse in their socioeconomical uh, makeup. Paul commends their sincerity in the final sentence of his letter where he says in chapter 6, verse 24, Grace be with you all, those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. And I'm thinking, man, this is a great church. This is a great church church. The city, not so much. Pagan, right? In their ways, right? Uh, sorcerers in so many ways, but the church was doing excellent. So I'm trying to gear up and try to figure out what is going to be, you know, if you could recall, I said these letters are going to be broken up into three uh, 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 categories, right? Uh, part one of, the, one of those categories is accusations. There's going to be something that Jesus finds wrong with this church, I'm thinking, what is it going to be, right? So let's read, right? This, this, let's go to scripture. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Remember, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 2. And I want to read uh, verse 2 and 3 and then jump to verse 6. Because the first part is their approval. And I, I kind of already know. I mean, Jesus, man, this is a great church. Let's see their approval. Look at it. Verse Two, I know you're, by the way, Jesus is speaking. <laughs> this is not, this is not like a conference president or the pastor or somebody coming to audit their uh, spirituality from the general conference. This is Jesus. All right. Here's what he says. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil, even, oh, sorry, evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false. Verse three, and you have, uh, you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Look at verse six. Yet this you, have, this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, we'll come to that, who also I hate. This is some great stuff. So let's, let's break it down a little bit real quick. Ephesus, first of all, number one, their approval. They are a serving church, right? Uh, they're busy doing the Lord's work. If I were to be back there and I asked to see their weekly calendar schedule, it, it, it must have been packed up, man. They were busy. They're, they must have filled all their offices. You know, some, you know, some of our churches are about to go through the nominating you know, process. I bet you they had a plethora of offices and they were proud of that and they filled all of those positions, but they were a serving church. It was not just that they were doing well from the inside. They were serving externally. I could imagine they had like a food bank or clothing store to help their community. I mean, that's what we try to get our churches to do, right? It's some good stuff. They're a serving church. 
They're also a sacrificing church. The word toil means to labor to the point of exhaustion. That's the literal translation. So, so this church, I mean, watch this. They're not just working. They're laboring. They are toiling to the point of exhaustion. Get the picture, y'all. Get the visual. Calendar is packed up with in-service and externals, in-reach and outreach, right? Get the visual. They're working. They're, 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 they're tilling the ground for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're feeding the hungry. They're clothing the naked. They're visiting those in prison. So much so that when these folks get home, all they have time to do is brush their teeth and go to bed. They're exhausted, but they're thankful for it. It's, it's fulfilling because it's the work of the Lord. I'm trying to think, God, what is your accusation going to be to these people? This is some good stuff. So they're a serving church. They're a sacrificing church. And let's skip it in the S's, right? Serving, sacrificing. They're a steadfast church. The word patience carries the meaning of endurance, but not just endurance. The word patience in the Greek here carries it uh, meaning to say endurance under trial. Remember, they're not the popular group in the city of Ephesus, right? Here you have it, this, this group, weird group uh, being, being preached to by a weird man by the name of Paul preaching about this weird God by the name of Jesus. Okay, he was born of a virgin woman. Okay, buddy. And uh, he healed. Okay, he died. Okay, I can see that he was risen. Okay, here we go. And he's the son of God. Makes, I mean, it's maniacal, right? It's, it's insane, right? So this group, but, but they're growing and they're flourishing, right? And so they're not seen as friends of the community, right? They're being persecuted to a certain extent, right? They're being looked down to a large extent, right? But they're steadfast, meaning that they're patient in their serving and in their sacrificing, enduring under intense trial. That's a great church. Man, let me pastor that church. I'm not saying Pontiac or Detroit Center. I mean, yes, they are. They're a great church. I'm just saying, if I want to take a third church, I'll take Ephesus. It's a great church. I'm not done. One more S. Not only are they a serving church, not only are they a sacrificing church, not only are they a steadfast church, they are a separated church, a separated people. That sounds bad, but it's good. What that means is Paul, he's the one that came and he said, man, I warn you guys, be very careful of false prophets, false apostles, false teachers that will come from the north, south, east, and west. Listen, when they come, at first, you don't know that they're false, Paul says in Ephesians. But because you know and are acquainted with the word of God, listen to them and measure them, not to your opinion. Measure them, not to your Facebook status. Measure them, not to your political affiliation. Measure them, not even to your denomination or religious affiliation. Measure them by the word of God under the authority and spirit of Jesus Christ. Mm. Right? So, and, and I say that even till today. I've been to six continents preaching the gospel. I always tell people, don't take my word for it. Even Ron Sidney. I'll, I, sometimes I'll share my opinion and I'll tell you it's my opinion. But when it comes to thus say the Lord, make sure you measure what I say to God's word through your own spirit being led by the spirit of God. So Paul says, be very careful. And they were, they were separate. They would, they would, okay, come preach, come preach. And if they didn't go according to the word through the Holy Spirit, they'd be like, yeah, get out of here, man. So they were a serving church, a sacrificing church, a steadfast church, a separated church. It's a good church. I want to pass to that church. Let me, pass. that's a great church. I mean, what more do you want? I mean, that's what we meet for our boards. That's how we strategically plan visioning everything, right? It's a great church. What's the problem? All right, here comes the accusation. Verse four, watch this. Verse four, chapter two, Revelation. Here's what it says. Jesus is speaking, remember. He says this, but I have this against you. Ooh, that's very hard words, man, coming from Jesus. I got this against you. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, let's, let's, what do you have against me? Uh, Jesus, that you, and verse four is short. It's interesting 
the accusation is really short, right? I have this against you, that you have left your first love, that you have left that just blows my mind because I would, I would constantly submit to people. I've said it. I've said it very regularly that if you don't love Jesus, there's no way you could be a serving church. If you don't love Jesus, there's no way you could be a sacrificing church. If you don't love Jesus, there's no way you could be a steadfast church or a separated church. Well, let's make it personal. If you really love Jesus, there's no way you could be a serving person or a sacrificing person or a steadfast person or a separated person if you don't love Jesus, right? I'm, I'm blown away that this church, Ephesus, did all of these things yet they didn't have the love of Jesus. That is concerning, which then begs the question, what is fueling them, right? Because I don't, I don't, get, the, I don't get the sense that they are just these evil, fake Christians. Remember, they are being persecuted, right? And maybe in, in Ephesus, it's not as hard, and we will discover it's not as bad, the persecution in Ephesus, as it is in other churches that we will talk about in the subsequent weeks, right? Their persecution was not to kill their lives, kill their physical body, right? They were chastised, certainly, by the establishment. Uh, jobs were taken away from them, certainly, and uh, they, you know, some of the guys couldn't go back to the, uh, to the country club, you know, but, but uh, and maybe some lives were taken, but it wasn't bad, right? So they're, but, 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 but they're still serving within that atmosphere, within that climate. It's quite tense. How are you able to do that and not have the love of Jesus? I, I, I'm blown away by that. This is, this is bewildering to me, right? This committed church, this hard working church. Jesus is saying, yes, you're committed. Yes, you're hard working, but you have a heart situation. Mm. You have a heart trouble. Your heart is not in the right place. Interesting. Um, in, 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 one scholar says that they, in fact, scripture speaks to this. They've lost their first love. Well, when did that happen? Certainly that must have happened after Paul, of course, certainly because he planted them and, 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 and he speaks to the importance of love. Yet at this time they've lost it. And so what many scholars believe, which I subscribe to is the at the sort of the the approval of the church um a lot of their positives sp speaks to what they were back in the old days certainly when they got planted they were planted in about 80 52 80 55 right Paul, uh, john is scribing this from jesus in about 80 92 so this is about 40 some years later time has gone by and so some scholars believe which i subscribe to that this uh, sort of approval, the serving, the sacrificing, the steadfast church um, may speak to the past. Yet in Revelation, Jesus speaks to the present tense, right? He, he could be merging the two, saying you've been this way and some of you are still this way today, but there is still a problem. The current problem is you have all these good things, yet you're missing the most important ingredients for a successful church, yea, a successful Christian, and that is love, <laughs> which not only Jesus gives, but Jesus is. He, 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 he does not just disperse love and does it willingly and freely. He is love. He is the epitome of love. You look at him, love defines Jesus. He is love, right? You're missing love. Maybe it could be translated by saying you're missing Jesus. You're preaching Jesus. You're testifying of Jesus. You're having Bible studies in the name of Jesus. You're, eat, you're eating veggie links in the name of Jesus. You're not wearing jewelry in the name of Jesus. You refuse to attend a movie theater. Okay, whatever. In the name of Jesus. You're keeping Sabbath in the name of Jesus. You're doing all those things in the name of Jesus. But there is no Jesus. There is no love they displayed Ephesus the works 
the labors, the patience. But these qualities were not motivated, I would submit to you, by the love of Christ. What you do, write this down. What you do for the Lord is important, but more important. Yeah, I said it. More important than what you do is why you're doing it. What is your why? What is motivating you? Are you are you motivated to pastor? Are you motivated to uh, have baptism? So at the pastoral meetings, you can boast and say, yeah, doc, doc, yeah, doc. Yeah, yeah, I baptized 20 people. Yeah, doc, look at me, look at me. Is, is that what motivates you? Are you motivated uh, uh, to speak in the language of Christian and Adventism because you're wanting to be picked uh, uh, and nominated to be on the board? Like, what's motivating you? Are you motivated to, to even serve in your community so that one day the news uh, uh, you know, company can come and say, hey, let's interview you and highlight you? What is your motivation? You see, it is very important to understand understand this. All of their approvals is what they did and how they did it. Those are very important, what you do and how you do. But what is the why? One writer puts it this way, and he's not a Christian writer, but it's a great book. Simon Sinek uh, in his book, uh, Start With Why, he, sub he uh, submits that uh, people, uh, consumers, don't buy into what you do or how you do it. You know what, what they buy into? They buy into your why. Like, why are you doing it? I challenge you. Ask any, certainly Adventists. I know there are many people that are listening that are not even Adventists, but let me speak to my Adventists. I, I challenge you. Ask any Adventist, why are you a Christian Adventist? And you know what the average Adventist would say? They would list for you what they do and how they do it as Adventists. Hey, bro, why are you an Adventist? Well, I'm an Adventist Christian uh, because uh, I keep Sabbath. I don't eat that oink oink. You know, I don't drink that uh, Hennessy. I don't smoke weed. Uh, you know, I keep the Ten Commandments, which is funny. <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah, okay, that's what you do. And if you're trying to attract the unchurched, certainly, yay. If you're trying to attract the young people, the m millennials and the Gen Zs, they don't buy into what you do. Here's what I tell people. When you ask me why I I am a Christian Adventist. Here is my why. Why is because I was once in sin. I was one I was once initiated in the environment of transgressions and, and, and temptations and, and transgressions and sin. And Jesus, I was not even good enough to ask for him. I was not even smart enough to seek his help. He came and he drew near me, picked me up from the miry clay and set my feet and delivered me. That is why. And set me free. That is why I'm a Christian. And because he saved me. Because he downloaded his love into my heart of stone. Making it a heart of flesh. Because I'm set free. Now let me tell you what I do. I keep Sabbath. I try my best through his will. Through his power to, to follow the Ten Commandments. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Yeah, that's what I do, but it's because of Jesus paid it all. Come on, say amen out there, right? Right? They were motivated, Ephesus, I gotta, I'm gotta. i about to wrap up. They were motivated by what they did. Their love, I would submit to you that they did have love, but their love was not for Christ. It wasn't primary. Their love was for how we look at, how we are looked upon in society. Look at us. Maybe there was a competition between them and the other churches in the, in, in, in the lower uh, Mesopotamia, you know, lower Asia Minor, you know, you know, from all the churches that Paul planted. Look at us. You know, we are the pillar. We are the mother church. I can't begin to tell you how many times I hear that statement in Adventism. Yes, we are the mother. church. No, the mother church is heaven. The mother church is the cross. Right. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know what motivated them, but there certainly needed to be a reordering of their loves. Because I believe they love Jesus, but I believe that that love for Jesus was third, fourth, fifth on the priority scale. There, there were other things uh, at, at the top. And I don't think Christ was saying, get rid of those things. He was saying, reorder your love. <laughs> some of you have to reorder your love. For some of you, you love money first. 
For some of you, you love prestige and status first. For some of you, you love the fact that you could win arguments on social media and, and get all the likes and that's what's paramount for you. For some of you, it's, 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 it's the last name that you have. Some of you parents, when you're shouting for your children uh, uh, to win a game, are you shouting their first name or their last name? What's more important to you? For some of you, you've placed all these things above your love and commitment to God. And all he's saying is, reorder your loves. Jesus needs to be paramount. It is the devotion to Christ that is often characterized, that often characterizes the new believer, right? When we first begin to follow Jesus, we hear words like, man, he's a fervent Christian. Um, he's personal. Uh, uh, he's excited. Um, um, you know, open display Christian, right? It's the honeymoon stage, husband and wife. The Ephesian believers were so busy maintaining their separation and their doctrine that they neglected adoration. <laughs> My Lord. They were so focused on legislation in the church that they forgot meditation. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Labor is not substitute for love. Neither is purity substitute for passion. The church needs both. Are you following me? We need leadership. We need doctrine. We need theology. But that should never take the place of passion and of deep love that comes from Jesus through his Holy Spirit. When Paul writes to the Ephesians in the book of Ephesians, he uses the word love over 20 times, 20 times. He even says in one letter, um, if, if, if you have prophecies, but don't have, come on, love, you are just simply making noise. Mm, I mean, how clear can Paul be? You're just sounding symbols. If you, if you know all about the prophecies and if you have all the doctrines, but yet you're lacking in love, then you're just making noise. Like, like it's annoying. How many of our churches are annoying? Yay, how many of you? Christian, yeah, you, I'm talking to you. You, Christian. How many of you, how many of us are annoying to the world, right? Because we're telling them what to do. The reason why a lot of Americans are running away from Christianity is because they think all Christians in America are tied to uh, a Southern uh, white evangelicalism, i.e. Uh, Republicans, i.e. Donald Trump. And I'm not against Donald Trump or the Republicans, but get the picture, Get the, hip, the hypocritical picture that is constantly displayed online, on, on the news. If you're a Christian, that's what you believe. We got to change that narrative. It's up to us, the true followers of Jesus, right? I don't want to be like sounding symbols, but Paul says, and I love, I love that Jesus brings up the Nicolaitans. Remember we read that in verse 6, the Nicolaitans. Jesus says, let me, uh, I, I, let me uh, admonish you as well. Let me, let me give you this, this accolade, right? I like how you deal with the Nicolaitans. Do you know who they are? Real quick, the Nicolaitans were a group of people that were on the other extreme. They preached love. They preached the love and grace and acceptance of Jesus. But yet they also preached that you, you, you do not have to follow. In fact, just stop following the commands of the Lord. You don't need to follow the laws and the doctrines and the commands of God. Just follow his love. See, Jesus, I love that he brings that up because what he's trying to let them know, I'm not telling you to go to that extreme. But, but, you need both. You need my word, right? My, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You, I am the word, John 1, 1. And the word became flesh, right? You need my word. You need my theology. You need my doctrines and commands. But it should be married with my love. I, I love... um. Martin Luther understood this and uh, the, the great church uh, ref, uh, reformer, who, by the way, was a, was a hater of the Jews. Another conversation. Uh, but, but God used him in a mighty way. And, one, and understanding the need for law and love, right? Um, he said, um, if, if, you, if, you don't, if you have extremes of both, it's like a drunk man riding a horse. 
the question is whether he's going to fall to the left or to the right. Either way, it's bad. So if you have love but no law, problem. If you have, if you have law and no love, problem. Because Jesus embodies both. <laughs> Ephesus, where is your love? I don't see it. It's part, of my, it's part of my character. It is who I am. And then finally, we, so first we went to the approval, then the accusation, and finally the admonition. We're going to have a song play here. Watch this, the admonition as we close. Verse 5 and 7. Verse 5 says, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. Mm. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent watch verse 7 he who has ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to him who overcomes thank you Jesus I will grant to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Christ reveals three ways. I'm closing here. Christ reveals three ways for them to have their first love restored. How many of you are so grateful that to know that we serve a Jesus, a God that is not only going to give us thumbs up when we do great things, but he's going to call us out on our trash and our mistakes, but does not leave us there. But he is in the ministry of restoration. Come on, say amen. Type amen. He wants to restore. And here is his plan for their restoration to go back to their first love. He says, number one, Remember, I'm going to use ours. Three, one, remember, he says, remember what you've lost and cultivate a desire to regain that communion and love with Jesus. Remember. There's uh, one, one of the greatest tragedies, uh, one writer says, and I'm going to paraphrase, I'm going to mess it up, but I'm going to paraphrase, is, is, you know, the greatest tragedy is, is if when we, is when we forget history, then we're poised to repeat it, right? If we, if we forget history, that's why history is so important. Hopefully we don't repeat 2020 again, right? Remember, remember not just what you lost, how you loved me, remember how it was when you lost me and you lost your love. It's not a good place to be, but remember what it was like so that you could be cultivated back to communion, regain communion with me, Jesus, in love, who is love. And I'll help you do that, Jesus says. Do you remember when you first fell in love with me? Do you? There was a song by Andre Crouch used to sing called Take Me Back. Take me back, Lord. Ellen White says, one of my favorite quotes, she says, uh, the Christian will do well if we just uh, reminisce an hour a day on the cross. Think about when you accepted Jesus. And maybe if you're, if you're struggling with that, maybe when you accepted him, you never really did fully accept him. But if you did, go back there. Revisit it. And I submit to you, revi uh, revisit it constantly, regularly. Remember, right? That's what I think makes a great marriage. I think about the moments when I first met Francis, the butterflies, the, the, you know, the nerves, the constantly thinking about her. I go back there. There are songs that I deliberately pl uh, play every, almost every day till today that just brings me back there and lets my love get, grow deeper and stronger for my wife. Christ says, remember that. Number two, he says, repent. I love the word repent. It literally means to, to, to turn around. Right? To not do a 360 because then you'll be back the same way, but a 180, a complete turn. Repent. You're going down a wrong path. Repent. Turn. Turn. Not just remember. Now, now that you've remembered it, repent from what you've done. And I would submit to you, your repentance needs to happen daily. Right? Change your minds. Confess your sins. And number three, he says, you must repeat your first works. The works you did when you first fell in love with Jesus. So not only do I want you to remember your first love, not only do I want you to repent, but I want you to remember the work you did when you actually loved me. See, what's fueling, if you're serving, 
And you're uh, saying, you're, what's fueling that? Is it, well, I'm Adventist and I want people to know I'm right. Remnant. <laughs> or is it, man, I want to share Jesus because he loves me and he loves you. And I just want you to know the good news. Remember, repent. And then repeat. Love. Love, Jesus says. Go back to the first love. Reorder your loves. What's number one? If it's not Jesus, he says, you got re to reorder that. Some of it needs to go down the list. Some of it needs to get out of the list. Reorder it. I would submit to you that some of our churches, forget that, that's important, but more important, some of our families, some of our marriages will have a fundamental baptizing renewed change. You think, well, we're doing all, all this stuff. Yeah, but where's the love? We're doing all this stuff. Submit to, where's Jesus? Is he there? How many homes today are, are, are void of the altar of worship? There's no Jesus. How many, how many, how many church, church members um, that I know of that are, and listen, there's nothing wrong in missing church, the actual attending to the building, but how many members I know are like, you know, dying because they thought that true Christianity meant attending church. But how many of us, even before COVID, we just drove to church because it was just the thing to do. I mean, we were told to do that. We're third, fourth generation Adventists. Well, well why? There's no love. You go to board meetings and you fight. <laughs> why? There's no love. You're, you're, you're upset because you didn't get this office in church. Where's the love? G Satan will get us fighting inside. And if he does, we win because then those that are outside will be missing on hearing the gospel of Jesus. So as I close, here is, I want to I share this quick story and then we'll close. The picture that you will see up here right now, I'm going to read their names. Uh, Herbert and Zel Zelmyra Fisher. Herbert and Zelmyra Fisher. Uh, for the longest while until uh, their, their, their death, I think she died last in 2013, they held the, the Guinness World Book of Records, may still do till today, for the longest marriage. They were married for 87 years. 87 years. When asked what was their secret, <laughs> here's what they said, the man said, forgive quickly. And she said, love lavishly to each other. Forgive quickly and love lavishly. Well, we know that Jesus loved us lavishly, y'all, because he loved us so much that he demonstrates his love, demonstrated his love by dying on the cross while we were yet sinners. He didn't do it because he was bored in heaven. He didn't do it because he had nothing else to do. He didn't do it because he wanted to gain a favor with the Father. He's got to. He did it solely, purely for his love for you and I and for all of humanity. So number one, appeal. You want to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Type the word accept. Right now, number two, you want to you want to ask God to forgive you. Uh, if you want to say I've lost my that love for Him and you want it back, you desire it back. You want to remember it, what it was like. You want to repent. You desire repentance. If that's you, just type the word words two words first love. And number three, you want to pray for others right now to regain for the first time or for the fifteenth time that love from Jesus so that they could love him back. Type the word others. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for full surrender. Thank you, Lord, for not even, not even having a second thought to surrender your life for ours, that by your stripes we are healed, by your last breath on the cross we breathed our first everlasting breath. But yet you're alive today, fighting on our behalf because you love us. Remind us, Lord, that though the work of church and, and, 
and, and, and the work of a Christian is important. You do not desire sacrifice. You desire faith and love. That's first. And everything else will come. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.